everybody. Welcome to another episode of Career Club's LinkedIn Live. My name is Bob Goodwin, and I'm the founder of Career Club. If you're not familiar with us, uh, we are helping folks uh, find careers that mean more to them by using proven sales uh, and marketing methods that uh, help folks find careers that matter to them. Uh, this is a live event, so you are welcome to ask questions, put in comments. Uh, we uh, have a pretty good uh, attendance today, so we may not get to every question or comment. And if we don't, apologies now. Uh, if you're not already connected with us on LinkedIn with Career Club and with me, uh, please do. We'd love to be connected with you so that you see uh, future events. Plus, we post content pretty regularly and would like to make sure that you see that. I um, want to also say thank you, as always, to my colleague, Heather, who is the magic behind making these events happen. So, Heather, thank you. And uh, especially today, because we had just a little bit of a technology snafu getting our guest uh, piped in from London, England. So with that, maybe that's a good opportunity to introduce our guest today, Bahij El Reyes. Bahij is a partner with Bain & Company, the consulting group, and helps look after their consumer products group. Uh, and Bahij, welcome. Thank you, Bob. Really nice to be here. Uh, different setting this time with the virtual one. Um, hopefully we can uh, meet in person soon. And Heather, thank you so much for your help. I know that uh, you do a lot of mag magic in the back scene. Really, really glad to be here. Yeah, no, it, it, she definitely does. You have no idea how much magic she does. It makes me look good. So thank you for that. So, Bahish, we met a few years ago. This is one of those random met on an airplane kinds of a thing. And it turns out we had a lot in common around consumer packaged goods and retail and kind of all the things that surround that. Um, and But before we, we dive into our actual topic, one of our little traditions here is uh, just a little bit of an icebreaker, just a few minutes, just to help folks get to know you a little bit. So an easy one. Where were you, uh, where were you born and raised, Bahish? So uh, I wish it was that easy, being Lebanese by origin. And like many of my fellow Lebanese were basically grew up in different parts of the world. So I was born in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, went to school there for a few years and went back to uh, my home country, Lebanon, did my education. Uh, and then uh, worked in the Middle East for five years uh, before moving to the States, where I've worked for nine years between Chicago and New York. And then I've been in uh, London for three years. Very good. Well, just in time for the pandemic, right? So exactly. well, for those of us in the States, we miss you. We're happy that you're in London and thriving. Mm -hmm. I personally miss you. Um, so uh, uh, just a little bit about your family. I, I know that you guys have a not too uh, distant addition to the family. That's right. I'm uh, lucky to be surrounded by girls. Um, and just for context, uh, you know, we're coming from a family of um, uh, you know, I have two two brothers, so we're basically, you know, our parents always said that, you know, uh, they wish they had they had more girls, and I think this generation, you know, I'm surrounded by by girls, which makes me very lucky. So for Father's Day, obviously, the last uh, yeah. the last few days were were were, were a joy. Uh, so I have to say, uh, the the um, motto of my life these days is finding a balance, right? So you know, what's the right balance across everything that uh, that's happening at home and and at work and with my clients and, and elsewhere. So I think that becomes quite important, which I know you are uh, watching many of your prior podcasts you touched upon. No, thank you. And, and, and that's exactly right. You know, if there's been a silver lining to the pandemic, it has been a little bit of a reset on priorities. And you probably heard me say this before. Before the pandemic, the frame was work and our lives had to fit into that frame. And now the frame is our lives and work needs to fit into it. And I think that we could probably all agree that that's been a healthy kind of recalibration of priorities. Um, you've had a very interesting career arc. We met when you were uh, at a prior company uh, before joining Bain, but do you mind sharing with folks just uh, kind of briefly your career arc? Absolutely. So, um... I always um, I had a drive in me to always work in parallel to my academics. So in my undergraduate uh, degree, which was in, in business and finance, um, I had five different jobs already. You know, mm -hmm. So I realized that probably that was one of the things to wanting to discover the, the workforce. Uh, and that was a really formative experience. Um, uh, because I realized um, you know, the different skill sets and got a view of the industries for all of the 
you know, if anyone is in, earlier in their career, I think it's really good to basically develop a broad spectrum of what's out there to figure out what you don't like. So that's how I started, which is not answering what I like, but, but I, what, answering what I don't like. And, um, and I started in finance, uh, I started in banking, uh, you know, becoming initially as a teller in a bank, then treasury, then private banking, uh, a bit of investment banking. So did a, did a series of different jobs. Even at one point in time, I was basically calling up people and asking about their retirement and whether they wanted sales, sales you know, different planning, their retirement. So did that at an earlier age and, and it taught me a lot. And, and I still carry a lot of those skill sets with me because, you know, you had to think about, you know, you know, sales skills and really being able to to talk to different uh, uh, types of people, etc. that I think stays on, that stays on with you. But then I quickly realized that while I enjoy a lot of the different jobs I had, I enjoyed the variety. And at the time, my professor told me, OK, you're speaking like a consultant and you may want to you know, go into consulting. And being in Lebanon, it was at the time a smaller market. You're not exposed to you know, all types of you know, consulting firms. So um, you know, didn't necessarily jump in and, and find opportunities straight away. I started working in a small boutique in Lebanon. Uh, that was very formative as well. Um, it was, uh, you know, by uh, by one of the, uh, uh, you know, senior partner in, in a big uh, big consulting company, and worked with him and uh, did a series of projects domestically. Then moved to Dubai, which was the next big market, um, and then quickly realized that uh, I needed to actually have international experience, and you know, also there's more to it than just work. Uh, so at the time, uh, you know, after, you know, five years in the Middle East, I pressed control alt delete on my life in a way and uh, moved to Chicago. And I remember when I moved to Chicago, it was in uh, February uh, 2011. Mm -hmm. And uh, the partner that, that talked to me then told me, you know, that there's a big um, temperature difference between Chicago and, and Dubai, uh, right? Being Dubai, which was so the peak of the, the, night, the, the, the season, the night season. And I remember getting to Chicago, it was a uh, lake shore was frozen, right? So, oh my gosh. Uh, so, you know, so that, that's why I, I moved there, but it was a very formative because I went out of my comfort zone and really met a ton of people, uh, you know, Chicago being a hub for the Midwest initially, yeah. you know, basically uh, got exposed to a lot of, you know, work, in, especially if as you do, my work has been in consumer packaged goods with a lot of my time spent in, with food companies. So spent quite a bit of time there and then had the chance to move around uh, the US. Uh, so New York uh, for, 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 for seven years, but I was always on the plane and that's how, that's how I effectively uh, we met, um, which is uh, you know a very uh, uh, you know you know great great experience, but it was very uh, uh, random, right? And then we realized we have a ton of things in common, as you say. Um, and then you know I realized that you know with time, and we, my wife was expecting um, we wanted to be closer to to home. Uh, so London was basically a good um, you know place to settle in and be between you know Lebanon and the U.S. and and I had the chance to basically move to Bain and um, within Bain, uh, you know, continue focused on, on consumer packaged good, but really with the intersection of supply chain, yep. which is nowadays uh, a very uh, topical uh, subject that, you know, a lot of people talk about, um, which is uh, which is important. It's going through massive transformation. And um, and I feel um, within my role, we can contribute a bit to uh, to this journey. Well, no, that's fascinating. Just a couple quick uh, side notes. You mentioned being younger and, and it was more of a test for negatives and finding out what you don't like. Um, if you're a young person listening to this or the parent of a young person, most people don't know what they want to do, but they start to figure out what they don't like. And, and it's just like, you know, playing sports or playing a musical instrument. You have to try different things to figure out what resonates with you or maybe what you don't like. So I think that's a really important lesson. The second yeah. thing was a little bit of the variety that you've had. And, you know, sometimes people in their careers, you know, are apologetic or regretful that they've had sort of this quilt work of experiences. But I really do believe that that ultimately contributes to a unique value proposition. You, you're drawing things from when you worked at the bank, you know, from other consulting companies, other experiences that you've had living in different places. And all of that creates a unique value proposition that makes Bahij 
you know, who you are and things that other people can't replicate. So I, I think that as you kind of went through that, there's some lessons to be drawn and, and clearly it's worked out well for you. Picking up though on, on the last point that you're making around supply chain, which is our theme for today, um, you know, supply chain is very front and center in the news these days for a myriad of reasons. And I know that you'll break that down a little bit. Um, but one of the things that I know that you believe is true, if you could begin to touch on it, is how supply chain is and should be more than just, you know, logistics and procurement, that it's a much more strategic thing for a company to be thinking about than maybe things that might feel a bit more tactical. Just kind of to start to create a little bit of a, of a ceiling or a roof for us to contain our conversation. Why is supply chain strategic and not just tactical? No, that's a good question. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm smiling because you're, the title was um, uh, now what, so what, uh, you know. What, and, what, what, so what, now what? Here we go. And then, you know, I had a bunch of basically my friends say, OK, is that uh, that sounds very framework, -y, you know, consulting style. But I really love it because you know, it brings the essence of it. Yep. Um, essentially, we went from an era where basically uh, supply chain was considered an enabler, moving boxes, you know, all about efficiency, scale, just in time, globalization, etc. Uh, where we started seeing, you know, probably five, seven years ago, you know, first site of you know transformation with the digitization and acceleration and what's happening and really um, the pandemic uh, changed everything because all of a sudden we had we had uh, uh, stockouts of the various goods and uh, people realized that uh, supply chain is a uh, is a critical critical capability needed to run organization. Mm. To the extent that uh, governments around the world uh, are basically uh, more than ever realizing this is uh, a critical capabilities for their survival and for GDP growth. And when you look at the investments being done by governments, whether it's in the European Union or whether it's North America or elsewhere, you know, it's, it's always been a critical capability, right? You know, supply chain being, being the need to do that. And, um, and now what we're seeing is a balancing act from, you know, uh, decades of industrialization, globalization, searching for efficiencies, really bringing down the cost so that, you know, people can have, you know, a piece of meat, you know, on their, on their uh, table for dinner every, every night, you know, for an affordable cost to basically realizing that, okay, no, there's basically a cost of doing things and there's probably a need for, for, for a, uh, for, for adjusting that. And now this is becoming a, as I said, a matter of national security, you know, from governments. It is becoming a matter of survival. Uh, there's, that's a big theme that we're seeing that for, for many uh, consumer companies in specific, you know, basically having a web funding chain supply chain allows them to make sure they continue uh, meet the business goals uh, that they have. And then uh, for some, not for many, it's a uh, it's a way to differentiate right so basically we're seeing for some uh, you know a well functioning supply chain is no longer an enabler it's a core uh, a strategic function to differentiate to meet their goals so whether it is supporting a direct to commerce or direct to consumer uh, initiative or whether it is platformizing supply chain or whether it is you know creating uh, you know, excellence in planning. Those are a lot of themes that we can, you know, tackle. Those are sources of differentiation that man, not many companies have. So that that's kind of the evolutions that, that I see. Yeah. So, so looking at our framework, so thank you, because I, I do love that framework. I, coming from market research, uh, we had a client one time that says, Bob, you guys are really good at the what, but I'm not sure so what about any of this. And if any of it is important, what should I do about it? So I, I really appreciate uh, you, you playing with me <laughs> with that framework because I do find it quite helpful. So, you know, if the if the what, you know, is obviously, as you say, the pandemic, but we've got, you know, um, other pressures that are acting, you know, on, on the world, whether it's what's going on in Ukraine and wheat, as an example, 
or here in the U.S. and in Europe as well uh, for different reasons, but related maybe. Energy is all sudden, you know, in short supply and high demand uh, that has all kinds of ripple effects. As you're talking with your clients, and, and again, if we can just make sure that we've got a good foundation here on just the, the what part of it, from a supply chain perspective, what are sort of the key things that you're talking to clients about that are most impactful that they should be most focused on when it comes to supply chain? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. So first of all, we're going through um, a hyperinflation market caused by a lot of the shocks that you talk about. Um, what we're going, the level of inflation we're seeing now reminds us of emerging markets and you know what we used to see you know in Latin America you know in the last uh, 10 20 years and we're seeing this you know in the US and in Europe and you know in the UK right and in different different um, different countries and this is alarming because uh, the uh, supply chains and the economies and the companies the way they run you know we're geared to low inflation that's what we yes. we're used to to get in a certain way so I think the first thing is, how do I survive? That's the first question I, I keep on getting, which is, how do I survive? How do I make sure that, you know, because I cannot, you know, just keep on raising prices, right? And there's a vicious cycle in raising prices where, you know, I raise prices and sometimes it's too high and I lose market share with the hope of, uh, you know, initially I raise the prices to alleviate the margin pressure I have, I end up losing market share and it creates more supply chain issues and I have a bigger problem, I have to raise prices again. So there's not an easy solve, right? So the, the first thing that, that, that we're getting nowadays is how do I, I fight inflation and what's that spectrum of levers that I could take from basically pricing all the way to design to value to procurement supply chain, etc. We have a spectrum of things that you could apply. And what's the right one and by market, by channel, by product, right? There's a different answer, a different unlock accordingly. The second topic uh, that I keep on getting is the whole topic of resiliency. And uh, nowadays as well, uh, with labor shortages, with packaging shortages, with energy prices, uh, there's pockets of places where we basically are not able to get the product on time or not able to get the product altogether. Just look at what's happening with uh, containers, uh, global ocean trade, massive inflation, right? So the the rate, uh, you know, the uh, rates have been increasing by you know two x uh, in the last year or so, and uh, you know, supply chain have globalized, right? In the last you know years, they all what they've done is they've they've looked to globalize, and with that type of increase, getting the right product at the right time, the right vessel, and moving it half halfway all the way to the world becomes problematic. Mm -hmm. So that topic of resiliency is not easy to tackle because it's cross-functional by nature. It's yeah. not something where I can say it's the way you uh, move boxes or it's the way you manufacture or it's the way you plan or it's the way, you know, it, it starts with, you know, what's my portfolio? Am I leading with the right portfolio or do, or do I have a lot of complexity that is not needed in the portfolio, then goes back to each of the functions from, you know, planning, uh, manufacturing, sourcing and delivery and all the way back to also customer service because there's a feedback loop of what's needed and, and how do you build that back in the supply chain. So that's another big topic uh, that, that we do. And, and then the third one, um, which are titles that we can, you know, if you'd like, you know, dive deeper is, okay, in light of, of, of bo bo both of these, et cetera, what's the balancing act? You know, I have commitments made to the streets and sustainability. Uh, I have to fight inflation. I have to basically, you know, digitize my supply chain. I have to drive resiliency. You know, the, the priorities you can imagine if you're a chief supply chain officer or a chief executive, you have so many priorities and you're not able to work on all of those. So what are the three or five that are most critical? And, you know, how do I focus on them? And then how do I trickle it down and make those decisions? So what's that decision agenda? I think that that's that's something uh, to think about. So so th it's almost a yes, no question. We can we can dive into it in a minute because I want to ask you something else really quick. But with, with those balancing acts, 
Does that vary by company or is that a standard answer for companies? You know, of course, it varies by companies and even within by company, it almost often varies by, by segment, etc. So you have to do the work and then really bring it back up and say, okay, given all of these, this is almost my treasure map of opportunities. And therefore, these are the ones I'm going to focus practically on. Yeah, well, we even saw this morning, probably saw that Kellogg is splitting into three, right? Because which is a tacit you know, admission that these are three different businesses that would have three different priorities. I want to touch back on resiliency, though. Uh, something that we haven't talked about before, but um, is another thing that is now in constrained supply is money, right? So if it's venture capital, that has turned, no pun intended, on a dime, right? That it was free and easy until it wasn't very recently. And all of a sudden it's like, very, these companies that were pitching a growth story now have to pitch a profitability story. And if I've raised a series B or series C, that next round is going to be way harder to come by than the previous rounds. Or if I am a big multinational, you know, one of the public companies that we all know, my cost of capital is going up very significantly. Like on a percentage basis, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe like from a year ago, even two quarters ago, what my cost of capital is. How are you seeing actually money supply impacting companies' priorities and ability to be resilient? Yeah, I would say it's money supply and it is um, also resource supply, resource in general. You know, capital being one of them, labor being another as well, which is talent, the talent, because we're seeing constraints in both, right? Constraints and money becoming more expensive. And frankly, if you ask anyone, you know, trying to hire how hard it is, uh, when you add those two up, right, that, that changes the dynamic completely. You know, and I, that's that's the point I'm trying to make, which is now it's all about, you know, prioritizing, you know. What are the must win battles that I need to do, right? You know, I cannot do everything. Uh, capital, you know, capital is no longer what it used to be. It's not much more constrained. In many ways, uh, which is a bit contrarian, what I'm about to say, in many ways, this is creating a healthy, you know, I, I know there is a lot of, you know, pressures, etc. But there is a, adjust, a healthy adjustment that is taking place of, okay, you know, uh, things that were going on for many years because, you know, there are just, got money and were able to raise much easily. Now, all of a sudden, they need to think about the fundamentals of the business, which probably was not taking place as much before. I think that's not such a bad thing. Uh, I think that, um, you know, uh, there is multiple ways to make a business case on, on, you know, whether you're a small company, you know, there's multiple ways to actually, you know, think through that, right? Um, And that value creation story become quite important. Yeah. And on the talent side, which, of course, at Career Club, we think a lot about, um, you know, we we do think and I think we, we see that uh, supply of talent is actually going to be opening up a little bit as people start doing layoffs, because if you're the CFO, CEO of these companies and you've got to make your number somehow, some way. People are not an insignificant cost in that. But it also, to me, reminds me of your earlier point about trying to take too much on price actually creates a bunch of negative consequences that kind of exacerbate over time. Yeah. So you start losing share. And in the same way, when you start losing talent, you lose your creativity and your ability to just get work done. That's, That's another, that's a bigger, bigger point you're making, which is what I see sometimes is that there is a series, you know, at Bain, we talk, keep on talking about future back and present forward, right? So there is a lot Say that of again hope. slowly. What is it? There is a, a big terminology we call future back. So really starting with where where the market is going to be, where my consumer will be in the future, et cetera, and reimagining the future. And then there is another thing where we think present forward, which is, okay, where am I right now and what do I need to do? And I see a lot of companies really thinking about present forward. So, you know, how I'm going to be able to survive and what do I need to do? How I'm going to make my numbers, right? Whether it's FTEs or not, or whether it is this or that. I see the the need uh, to sometimes also take a step back and make sure that the series of measures you're doing now 
is going to allow you to thrive five years from now. And, and I ask, you know, I ask that question to, you know, you know, every client I meet, which is, okay, is all of the set of actions you're doing right now going to allow you to be more successful five, 10 years down the line? And uh, it's not an easy solution, right? And you almost have to do both simultaneously. Simultaneously think of the future and, you know, how your consumer, you know, if you look at the consumer in the future and with the fragmentation of trade and with, you know, all the new channels that are rising and, you know, uh, uh, that demand, you know, that keeps on changing. Uh, when you look at, uh, you know, your sustainability commitments and, and what you need to do in the future, uh, when you look at, uh, you know, how the market is going to change, you then start thinking, okay, as I manage my supply chain today, am I moving in that direction or am I taking measures just to survive and go after this crisis? And I'm going to have another almost self-made crisis three years from now right. because the action that I took today were just being reactive to what I'm going through. And that's a really important discussion that not a lot of companies are going through. Well, you know, it, it sort of harkens back to your third pillar, which is this balancing act, because I need to, if I'm a public company, satisfy the street and my shareholders sufficiently. So I'm around next year to worry about, you know, the future problems. Yeah. But, you know, at the same time, you know, to your point, are the short term actions that we need to take right now consistent with or, you know, in alignment with? where the business needs to be in three, five years, or are we going to have to basically have a form of tech debt that needs to get paid down on another day? That's right. I think that um, in, in every transformation that you're doing, you need to basically, there's no regrets move that, you know, that you need to do for sure. Right. And I think that there's no, there's absolutely no time to wait. You know, with the inflation rates we're seeing, there that's not a luxury that you have to actually go think of the future uh, only. So you have, there are things you need to do. There's a standard toolkit on inflation. If you're not following it, then, you know, you're probably missing out, right? And yeah, that, that one of the things we do is typically, the first thing we do is, okay, you know, what's the balance of levers that you should apply between commercial, meaning, you know, pricing and, and, and changing your trade, et cetera, and between you know uh, supply chain and operational le levels, right? And you have that answer: is it well articulated, or are you being transactional about it? So I think there is a playbook on inflation that is really important that you apply right now, and really understand all the levers that you have, and which one is going to be significant, which one you can apply. Yeah, but then I, I... there's a need. There's a need to simultaneously, you know, uh, change the business as well, which is, you know, how can I get ahead of the curve? And that's that's the really hard thing. It's not easy. How can I get ahead? How can I stop being reactive? Because you know a lot of the things is just being reacting, reacting to what you're going through. How can I get ahead? And you know, uh, digitization is is a key enabler for that. Data and analytics as well. And I'm sure now, like you know, the hot topic these days is control tower, right? Like you know, there's a lot of that buzzword being used. And it, which it, what it means, control tower, is you basically establish real-time visibility of a particular category where you get to see real-time what's happening. So you're able to actually steer the supply chain one way or another. And it can apply to different types of, of, of capabilities. Uh, it's important that as you basically roll out those type of capabilities that allows you to future-proof your organization, to also think about value delivery to also think, okay, how I'm gonna be able to make better decisions. And for this not to become, you know, just a capability discussion that does not have a hook. Uh, and um, and that's where we see a lot of uh, benefits coming in. Well, so let's, let's talk about this a little bit. So one of the things that, that we had in a prior conversation was around, you know, yes, you can take price, but the brand needs to perform to the price, right? So there's a value part of that. I, I, I'm going to ask this. I'm, it's going to sound like a statement. I mean it as a question. As you look at somebody like Proctor, who you know uh, historically and even now tends to be more premium priced, but they justify the pricing through superior performance of their brands, so that you know 
not only are they able to kind of keep their more than head above water from a pricing perspective, but because they're building into the mind of the consumer and in reality, we hope, you know, superior performing products that they're not caught in this whipsaw of being reactive back and forth, reactive back and forth, that that short term action is consistent with the long term value of the brand. That was a statement meant to be a question. Could you kind of opine on that piece? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, you know, I'm not going to comment on particular companies, but basically, you know, um, what we're seeing in general across the industry is that there is the topic of insurgent brands coming in and basically changing the dynamics. So insurgent brands are typically smaller companies that have been created, you know, not too long ago uh, that, you know, operate still, you know, like a startup almost. And, uh, and usually what they're able to do is be very, very close to the consumer and much more reactive to what the consumer has been. And our research shows is that those insurgent brands have been taking share from the big corporates much, much more uh, uh, you know, faster than, than, than anything else. So what is changing is that you, know, you have those top 20 CPGs uh, around, uh, around the globe uh, facing also a balancing act of, of, the, of, of themselves, right? Which is, you know, uh, first of all, I'm getting competition from, you know, an atypical set of competition I have. Mm -hmm. My toolkit that I've used in the past, which is, you know, thinking of pricing and price, pricing, price increases, is no longer working as, as it is before. And I'm faced with all of those challenges that I have. And my balancing act is, how do I uh, navigate the present and transform for the future? That, that's not an easy task. And that's, I think, what CEOs are, are trying to, to think about, which is how do you do both? Uh, and usually, uh, and, and you know, at the time of a crisis where you know, no one has a lot of patience to actually you know, do conceptual stuff, right? Like, you know, or think of the future and you know, used to be five, 10 year strategies, et cetera. We're not talking about that, but you're talking about how do you make sure that whatever steps you're doing now is not gonna go against your sustainability commitments, as an example. Yes. So, so I was reading some some Bain thought leadership coming into this call in, in around supply chain, and you know some of the things that you guys talk about is you, you can actually use supply chain as a competitive advantage. If I'm in stock, and a consumer's preferred brand is not in stock, that generates trial almost by definition that would not have happened before. There was customer satisfaction. Your retailer's happier with you, right? Because you are able to continue to keep product on shelf, which, you know, depending on where you fit in the brand hierarchy, could allow you to leapfrog and become a category manager where you haven't been historically because you're showing category leadership. Um, obviously, being able to honor your financial commitments better and there's a host of, of other benefits. As we help clients think about you know, strategically using supply chain and moving it away from, I like how you say this, you know, moving boxes to, there, those are some pretty powerful levers that, that have real significant financial impact. The supply chain doesn't all have to be this big negative or just trying to squeeze the last penny out of a vendor. Could, so could we make it, that? Yeah, we usually make it very practical. Okay, you know, so how do you take something and make it very practical? And the first thing we do is we basically uh, think about a segmentation within, you know, any company. Just start by understand where my future portfolio is going to be, which are my basically my growth, like where my growth is going to come from, which ones are basically, you know, what categories, channels, portfolio dynamic is going to be, uh, you know, big important pieces, but are not necessarily going to grow. I just need to keep, you know, survive with it. What are options, basically small things I'm doing that, you know, may not move the needle, but they're really important because I'm testing on each one of those. So, you know, starting with that, then we translate it into supply chain terminology and we say, okay, I probably need to run three different types of supply chain. I need my you know, simple and efficient supply chain where basically I'm going to go in and make sure that um, it's as lean as possible, uh, that I'm you know, managing to cost and really you know, drive it. And, and there are certain decisions you do to actually do that. 
Then you have another one, which is, okay, this is my growth priority. I want to be in stock all the time. Service level is number one. I am going to be make sure that I'm fully resilient. I want to make sure that if one plant goes upgrade, I have another one. I want to bring my co-packers and third-party manufacturers and basically become much more strategic with them. So there we deploy the full resiliency playbook end to end, right? To make sure that I'm supporting that growth environment and, and make sure that I invest in the right way. And, and there's a series of decisions that I need to make uh, to actually support that. And then there is basically a third one, which is, listen, this is not going to be, uh, this is not going to move the needle, but these are a series of bets I am doing because I'm confident one of them in two years, three years, four years is going to become big. Uh, and I need to constantly test and trial and change and whatever. And I cannot run it in those two other supply chains. I need to run it in, in a different differentiated supply chain. And there you basically take a, you know, uh, you, might, you, you, you design a supply chain for complexity. So you realize that you're going to have a ton of changeovers, that you're going to have a completely different set of parameters to work with. And those are three very different and, um, and run very differently with different infrastructure, ways of working, et cetera. And there may be others as well, right? You know, you can have one for sustainability, which is which is which is different. So that's a little bit what I also mean with balancing act, which is you really understanding your priorities, your segmentation, and designing the right uh, answers for each. Um, super helpful. I, the the quality thinking is amazing to me. If we think of from the retailers' perspective, this, I feel like we've been a little manufacturing focused. Yeah. If you sort of flip the lens and looked at it from a retail or a channel perspective, how, how would you advise people to be thinking about this? Uh, so if I'm thinking from a retailer perspective, um, it, I, I would say you're even closer to the consumer. And it, I would start before talking about supply chain. Uh, that's probably not the right place to start with, which is, you know, how you're going to create more loyalty with your consumer and, and, and keep on increasing your, your, your share of wallet and, and, and market share. And, you know, partly is thinking of the whole uh, discussion around platforms, if you're familiar with that. And, and what I mean with platform is, you know, are you uh, going to be transactional with your customers? So basically keep on selling them, you know, your, your goods and, and, and the way you have and be a trader. Or are you gonna uh, basically uh, offer them a wide variety of services and change that dynamic? And what mm -hmm. we're seeing is that retailers more and more embody the concept of a platform. So basically, they're really thinking about uh, themselves more as uh, you know, thinking of my purpose is X. It could be health and wellness. It could be gaming. It could be you know, there is multiple. Let's take health and wellness as an example, and you create a series of services and ecosystem. You know, by bringing you know dietitians and clinicians, etc., creating events, commerce, and, and link those all of those up, right? So I think retailers are doing quite a bit of that work, and then in the back end of it, you know, do data monetization and really thinking about uh, you know um, uh, you know how you actually um, transform that business. So that is happening in the background. Now, what's the role of supply chain there? I think as you think of your supply chain, it's a key enabler for your growth. Uh, and there, basically, the view is, okay, given all of that, what are all the different supply chains that I need? And for all, each one of those, what are the series of decisions on how do I gonna do my fulfillment? And I may have 10 different options from fulfillment, from dark stores to micro fulfillment to, you know, big uh, automated uh, warehouses to manual to, you know, there's a series of decisions of those. and. It is about creating the right level of um, analytics to balance service levels with the right cost to serve and you know the right sustainability uh, to make sure that you know I'm serving my customer in the most ideal way. I think that that's a little bit the dynamic that they're faced with. And then kind of marrying the two, uh, if we could put this under the heading of collaboration, what are best practices that, that you would advise or observe on on how manufacturers and retailers can best collaborate around yeah. supply chain? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that, um, you know, the one example I like to talk about is to take the food industry. Okay. 
you have millions and millions of farmers and you have a you know a, you know seven billion eight billion consumers keeping on changing and you have only a few companies in between 60 companies controlling 80 percent share um and um and there's no way those companies survive if i'm still thinking of myself just in my industry without really creating value chain partnerships and that value chain partnership goes way broader than retail consumer manufacturer it goes all the way back to uh, the farmer right and really creating you know coalitions and consortiums and we're seeing quite a bit of that happening uh, and, you know, just think about uh, wheat as, a, as an example that you mentioned earlier. You know, what's that alternative look like and what does that take to actually incentivize the entire value chain to actually move to move, move to that? Right. And I think it takes a lot of effort to create a coalition to change that and quite a bit of partnership. So I see more and more of that happening. Of course, I think there is the typical retail consumer packaged good company, you know, uh, collaborative planning and forecasting, you know, that's been going on for years and I think it will continue. Uh, but um, what we're talking about now is a step change and, you know, multi-party partnerships, uh, really, uh, you know, uh, much stronger alignment and then sharing of digitization uh, to actually being able to, to track uh, goods all the way to the to the source, which is a big yeah. problem. So, so it'll be interesting. I mean, you know, topically, what I think has been in the paper here with retailers reporting their results the past couple of weeks is there's the, there's a, a bunch of inventory coming in the retailers don't want. They kind of ordered for the pandemic, the, like a different version of the pandemic and where consumers' minds were and their wallets were. And you know now people want less patio furniture or a computer and now they want to go travel. They want to go eat out in a restaurant. Um, what do you think some of the, the impacts on both the manufacturers and the retailers can be with working through some inventory? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a tough one because basically, um, as you say, the world is changing. It's changing, changing so fast. And a lot of that inventory that was planned is always, you know, the typical way is you look at what last year was and you say, okay, it's going to be very similar. What we're seeing is a lot of patterns are changing, weather and, and changes and that just changes completely. One season forces the other. What you could use for outdoor furniture may not be needed, right? So there's a ton of dynamics that are taking place. Um, and, you know, some of the best in class companies I've seen are basically looking at sensing capabilities and planning. Uh, so being able to, uh, instead of a plan based on historical, which uh, you basically uh, look forward and think about uh, creating different sensing capabilities and different algorithms to be able to see what's going to be needed in the future based on a series of parameters. So it changes the dynamic on, you know, uh, what did I sell last year to what should I sell to? Um, what, are, what are the things I have to believe to carry that type of inventory? Yeah, and, and it, that changes completely how you plan. And I see quite a bit of that movement, which is, you know, sensing what's ahead and really changing, uh, changing uh, what you're saying. Well, you, you had spoken about data and analytics, and this is like demand signal forecasting right. and things like that. And, exactly. and you talked about speed and agility yeah. and, you know, just having better tools and, and better metrics to really be able to is back to future back to be able to kind of anticipate what's coming down the road rather than how do we just recast what we did last year because we're seeing that playbook probably doesn't do very well that's in right the environment so being respectful of time Bahij, um if if you could put all this in just a little bit of that what so what now what package you know, yeah what, what would a summary kind of look like is it from a, a bang perspective yeah absolutely i think on the what more than ever supply chain is critical to the competitive to create a competitive advantage to companies right it's just not about survival it is about being able to, to thrive we see it based on all the crisis that we have we see it based on the tense geopolitical environment uh, we see it based on uh, the changes in consumers taking place you know your supply chain is is your, your, your critical capabilities. Uh, so what, I think there is a call to action, uh, you know, to basically to, uh, uh, to shift the dynamic of your supply chain from, uh, you know, 
an enabling function to a core business function that is sits at the table and collaborates with uh, you know your your set of stakeholders and is fully anchored in business decision it takes part in shaping a strategy of going to a new channel a new market or basically growing your core capabilities and you're now what is basically you need to create a balancing act between uh, the levers to survive this environment we live in, which is, you know, unusual, uh, you know, from deploying the right playbooks to fight inflation, you know, making sure you're, you're, you're resilient, you know, you're making sure you have traceability in your business to transforming the business and thinking of digitization, thinking of, uh, you know, future of, uh, of, of supply chain and, uh, and what it takes from a capabilities uh, to lead in the future, knowing that there is this uncertainty. Right. So, you know, embracing that uncertainty and saying this is going to be part of, of my business, embracing that uncertainty, how would that how my business would look forward? I think those are the, the three layers. No, really appreciate that. It, this is going to be a little bit of a random question here at the end. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll uh, take it as such. To me, it feels like all of this is predicated on that the company has a strategy and that they've got a good strategy, a workable strategy. And so because of prioritization and things like that, we know what needs to be prioritized. Just whether this is quantitative, qualitative, whatever, how well do you feel overall clients actually have a good workable strategy or they really need to do control alt delete and a little bit of a start over? Yeah, you know, uh, someone told me a, a say that stuck with me because it was very intuitive, like what Mike Tyson says, everyone has a strategy until they're punched in the face. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's the best analogy, but I feel it's a reflection of what we're going through. Everyone had a strategy and plans and what they wanted to do, etc. And they've been basically going coming after with a series of shocks one after the other. Yeah. Uh, from uh, you know COVID to the macroeconomic with Ukraine to you know what's happening in the world with labor and containers and all of that, right? So it's one after the other, um, and I feel that uh, very few strategies embed uncertainty. Uh, so you know it's you know in many cases I feel the, uh, the strategies are still done in a very old-fashioned manner. Uh, and, uh, you know, let's basically plan things, etc., by channel, product, whatever. And, um, and actually what we live in is a series of uncertainty, which basically says, you know, what do I have to believe uh, to actually get to this point? And what happens if, I, if those things are off? You know, what would that mean, right? I think that is completely a different mindset of, of thinking of the future. And that's what I see leaders spend their time on, which is, uh, you know, moving from a very clear view of the future to what do I have to believe type of view and really translating that into what does it take to win? I cannot think of a better way to end this conversation. I think that's great. Um, Bahish, thank you so much. I mean, like I'm honored that you would uh, devote a few minutes. Uh, the fact that you're sharing your expertise with our audience, I know that they appreciate. It's a very, very important topic. It's not niche, it's core to strategy and winning uh, today and in the future. And so um, I just want to say thank you. And I really appreciate you taking the time today. Bob, it's been a real pleasure and honor as well. And uh, I'm a big fan of, of your podcast. I think you've had uh, really great lineups in the, in the past weeks. And uh, and I look forward to, to continue listening to it on the weekend. Oh, well, we had our cleanup hitter today. So now we continue with a great lineup. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, we wish you well and uh, blessings.